I will say what I say before we enter into the Old Testament book. We are going to extrapolate what the actual content is saying and in context. But most importantly, because we're Christians of the New Testament, we need to know what from the scriptures from the Old Testament we can pull, what principles and strategies and skills we can pull out to make us better Christians. So that's our main focus of this book of the scriptures. And without further ado, we finish chapter six, so we start chapter seven today. Let us begin. Thus far, the nation of Israel has come into the land of Jericho. And the walls have come down, folks. And so far, it was every indication that the nation of Israel did exactly what they were supposed to do. But you know what happens with the flesh, right? It becomes content, it can become weak, it can become lazy. Let's see what happens now. It doesn't take the whole nation to, to influence them. Yes, ma'am. Oh, chapter 7, I'm sorry. Joshua chapter 7. Anybody, I'm sure there's some baker here. I don't like a lot of baker for Christmas. Anybody bring the yeast? The Bible, the Bible gives a metaphor for yeast. What's the metaphor for yeast? The King James calls it leaven. Well, what, is it, what does it represent? Exactly. And in the specific context, sin. And it's saying a little bit of leaven, leaven that's a whole lot. In other words, a little bit of sin can affect a lot. We're going to see that right here in chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 1. But the children of Israel committed trespass in the accursed thing. What, what, what does the Bible mean by accursed thing? A cursed thing is when the nation of Israel went into the land, they had a lot of brass, gold, silver, bronze. And God told them not that they not be anybody to take it for themselves. But to put it in the Lord's treasure. But the nation of Israel committed the sin. Last week we went through the Rocky 725, where this was always told of the nation of Israel. So it wasn't anything new. They should have known that God was just reminding them. But you always have somebody doing something. It says, committed the trespass in their first thing. For Achan, he's named, for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zebedee, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. You know, for years I always wondered when the Lord says something, how it goes to trace it back to family lineage. Did that mean everybody was bad? No, it's just saying no matter what we're doing, we're leaving something on the legacy. If my child, Ricky or Thomas, chose to sell drugs, that's going to affect our legacy. So it goes back to that. That's why there is such a grave responsibility in our job and Christian parents to bring up their children in the Lord. Because there's an influence there. You know, I tell people, you know, we speak a lot about personal language. We should. Because it's, it's, it's our job to go out and spread the gospel. You know, what's the E? And when I say easy, I don't mean easy like it's not a challenge. But you know, I should say what's the most natural way to spread the gospel? Bring your kids up in. Because if you raise your kids up in and they accept it, that's a natural way. What's for the intro? Then that's a natural way for the church to naturally grow. And they will have been in the church and hopefully they will marry a young lady or a young man a spouse that's in the Lord. And then the church has a natural progression. Never underestimate the power of our family living. That's why I called out like this. But now the Lord was upset at the nation of Israel. Verse 2. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Bethlehem, in the east of Bethlehem, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and view Ai. Now watch what's going on here. Look where Joshua was supposed to go. Remember, they were supposed to overtake the land of Canaan. The first land they overtook was Jericho. They did it with no problem. It was a trust factor. It wasn't being dealt with yet. Now Joshua was already said, Joshua was the military, but he's ready for the next venture. The next venture was to take over Ai. So what was the first step in taking over Jericho? Send in the spies. Remember the two spies Joshua sent in? 
Then they went right there. Now Joshua is getting ready to go into AI. But you know how dangerous it is to go into a military campaign and you have to send it again? You see, because remember, who was really winning these victories? The nation of Israel. God was winning it because they were obedient. There was some disobedience there now. You see how he can sin because he wrote other people dying because he chose to do something that was selfish. And it's easy to say, well, that's not fair. But really not. I'm not going to question God. I'm just going to try my best to influence the Bible team. I'm going to try to influence. Hey, God, and if we go in here, we got to make sure we're all we. If the end of sins, it can affect all of us. It's no different than the military. I remember going through boot camp. As simple as this is. And I was charged to have my own little fire team. It was four guys. And we went out into the bush, and it was the drill instructor's job to find us. And we were hit real good. And somebody just sneezed. I don't know if you all heard of bends and thrusts. It's a type of exercise that will wear you out. We did them for a good hour. We were tore up because of, and I, I the, 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 the drill instructor was a good guy. He said, you, you look like you're upset. He was looking at me. And, I, and I, I, I thought twice, Steve, whether to say yes, I was or no, I wasn't. I said, can, can I just ask you a question? He said, yeah, but put sir at the beginning and sir at the end. I said, sir, all my man did was sneeze. And now we're in trouble. He says, yeah, you sneezed here. Look at the trouble you But when you're, when you're off the coast in, 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 uh, in Kuwait or Iraq and you sneeze, you're just giving away your position and are y'all going to die? I understood what he meant, Sister Faye. <laughs> After that, he says, you, you, you could have held on to that sneeze or put it down in your arm to make it to where it wasn't as loud because it was just like, that's you. He was totally out of his environment. And I was like, wow, it takes a mentality. If you want to win it, you'll figure out a way to win it. And as Christians, if we truly care about each other and not just talking, we'll look after each other. I'm so grateful of the calls and stuff I get with this thing on my foot. I know y'all have great love for me and I have great love for you too, because you're showing it. But that's the only way we're going to win this. You see, if we don't do that, you know who, who we give the advantage to? Satan. We're just making it that much easier when we don't do that. Let's see what happens here. Verse 3. And they, the nation of Israel, or the, the spies, returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and, and make not all people to label thither, for they are but few. So there went up thither of the people, about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. That's, that's not sounding real good, guys. It's not sounding like what they did at Jericho. And the men of Ai smote of them about 30 and six men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shivron, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. What happened to wherever your feet go, I'll give you victory? Were the people responding like they were with Jericho? Something was wrong. Verse six, and Joshua rent his clothes. Rent is not like, you know, you rent a home or you buy a home. Rent here means he tore his clothes. That was a, when you rent your clothes, that was a sign that you knew that something was going wrong and you were attempting to repent. Joshua knew something was wrong. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening tide he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. They were repenting. They knew something was wrong. My only question for Joshua was, why wasn't there an assessment done before they went to the next battle? You know, every time you battle, you have to clean yourself up. You got to look, especially when God is fighting your battles. It's like, God, is there anything that we need to do correctly? Even before we started this Bible study, what do we do? Pray. No matter what you do, try to always pray beforehand to make sure God can reveal something to you that you may have to correct. I've made mistakes in my life. When I go back and I try to rest, what my sermon is about today, about a mindset of repentance, I try to do it every morning and every evening. I try to look at it and say, Lord, what, did, what could I have done better? Where did I fall short today? And I always try to clean that up because you don't want to carry that with you. 
Imagine an example I like to use. Just imagine if you were running a marathon. You were ready, Sister Faye. You fit and everything. And they said, you got to carry this 50-pound weight the entire, entire way. That race takes on a whole different perspective at that point because you weren't supposed to run with all that weight on your back. Such is the case with sin. As Christians, we're not supposed to carry sin in our lives day to day to day to day. God provided an easy way for us to cast our care upon him. The question is, do we do that or do we get comfortable and take it for granted? In the sermon you're going to see, we're supposed to constantly take a look at that. Because we could easily be out of God's grace because we've chosen to be lax. Or we're so caught up in the work of our job that we've forgotten to repent. Now, God gives us a lot of opportunity to get it right. The question is, do we take advantage of those, of those opportunities? Let us continue. Joshua and the elders of Israel are in the state of repentance. Verse 7, and Joshua said, alas, O God, wherefore, <laughs> Joshua knows, like, okay, something's wrong. Wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites? to destroy us, which to God we have been content and built on the other side of Jordan. You know what's amazing about this too? Remember when they took over the nation of Jericho, there was over a million people there. They're dealing with a couple of thousand now and they're losing. So what you bring to their attention too, this is not about us. This is about our obedience to God. And verse eight, O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies. For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us around and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? Now, I like what Joshua is saying so far, but he's leaving something out. He's leaving out what did we do wrong? Or where did we fall short? Oh, now all Joshua's looking at now is, well, when the, the, the Amorites, all these ites, when they beat us down, it's going to make your name look bad. And there's some truth to that, but God has already told him, as long as you, remember Joshua 1, as long as you obey my word, meditate in it day and night, is that happening? And is he checking in on his people to make sure they're doing the same thing? This is the burden of leadership. When the Bible talks about elders, the overseer of your souls, Gail and I have a great responsibility to make sure we check in on you guys and make you guys make sure if you're going through something, you let us know so we can assist in every way. That's a serious responsibility. When that, when that doesn't happen, that's enough opportunity for Satan to creep right in the door. And then we get some foolishness going on that if it's not dealt with, can split a congregation. I've seen it and I've read a lot about it. It's like, wow, trace all that back. The, the, the most foolish one I've ever said, and I won't be real specific, but it was a congregation in South Florida. We traced the issue back. Guess what the issue was, folks? Somebody was upset because when they came in, the elder didn't say hi to him. It wasn't here in Miami Gardens, but it was in South Florida. So he could he, he, he could have said something to me, and we spoke to the elder, and he says, I didn't even know. I was just walking in. You know, I'm sure you've done it before. You're in a rush to get in. He was heading to a Bible class, and he was running late. Just like I was this morning. You know, you, 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 your focus is on me getting here, get set up so we won't start late. That's not that I'm trying not to speak to you, but that all led to things being spread. But he thinks he's all that. He don't care about all that. And then it was divided. Some was for this elder, some was for that elder. And I was like, wow. And then they split, started another congregation, which is a travesty if you study how congregations are supposed to be formed. You won't find any area in the Bible where just because I'm upset, I'm going to go start my own. That's not how congregations were started. That's how a lot of them are doing now. But that's not Bible-based, folks. It's not. Go do your own work. No, it's supposed to be God's work, and it's supposed to be sanctioned by an eldership. That's why the, the actual term is planting. You plant congregations. That's planned. The elders may agree, well, Charles, since you live over in a certain area, there's no Church of Christ over there. We're going to send some people with you to go door knocking and spread the gospel, and hopefully we can get a work going over there. That's how it's supposed to be done, not in spite of, well, I, I got an issue with Steve, so I'm going to get away from Steve and start my own work over here. That's not how the Church of Christ is supposed to grow. Not at all. 
but may we try our best to tie into what's God's desire. You know, that's what worship is really all about. You know, you have worship and you have entertainment. Entertainment is what you desire. Nothing wrong with that. If I want to hear some jazz, I'll go hear Kenny G. I'll pay for it. I pay for what I get. But if I'm going to worship service, I don't come in these doors thinking, well, this has got to be, I hope so-and-so is preaching, I hope so-and-so is singing. That's the polar opposite of worship. Is the brother up there preaching from God's word? Amen. Is the brother singing godly songs from them? Amen. Then it's worship. It was never designed to be entertainment. And that's what I challenge a lot of our sister congregations on. There seems to be a movement towards more entertainment than worship. That's scary, folks. Don't, don't fall afraid of that. That's, that's deadly. That is not what worship is. Worship and entertainment really have nothing in common. Because our worship is all about what God wants. What does God want? We don't have to guess. It's right here. It still scares me when I'm when I have to debate somebody over whether we should have mechanical instruments in church worship. It's like, that's not even a debate. And then they always lean on, well, God didn't say you could use it. That's right, because he told us what we're supposed to do. I said, how many times when your mother told you to do something and she didn't tell you that you couldn't do it, you, 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 you chose that, that angle. Your mother said, okay, go ahead and warm up some hot dogs. When we get in, we'll have a hot dog dinner. You chose to put a T-bone steak in the oven that she was saving. She said, I didn't tell you to do what you didn't say I couldn't do it. You know you wouldn't dare tell your parents that because they told you what to do. They told you to vacuum the floor before Spider-Man came on. What did you do? Well, I watched Spider-Man first. Well, what did I tell you to do? See, we, we try all that to God, but we don't do it to other people because it, it, be, it becomes a cop-out and we should not do that. God's word is crystal clear when we read it. Let's get back to Joshua. Verse 11, here we go. I'm sorry, verse 10 of Joshua 7. It says, and the Lord said unto Joshua, get thee up. Why? Because he was down. He was repenting. Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Does God sound serious? Mm-hmm. Because he's going to tell them straight what they're supposed to do. Verse 11. Israel had sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen, and disassembled also. And they have put it even among their own stuff. Is God making it clear? Verse 12. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies, because they were a curse. Neither will I be with you anymore, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. God is serious about his, about his obedience and disobedience. You see, the God could have just said, well, the, you know, the, the enemies don't know about this. Go ahead on. Mm -mm. That's what you call integrity. You're either going to be for God or you're going to be against him. And as the, as the seasoned folks would say, when you're half-stepping, you're against God. It's got to be all or nothing. I, I, when I said that one day, a person said, well, how do you know that? In Revelation, and you, you all have heard me say this before, in Revelation, God said, either you are hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I spew you out of my mouth. Now, what's the interpretation of that? God is saying, because you're lukewarm, that means you're on fire sometimes, and other times it's like, ah. God can't stand that. You know what spew means? It means vomit. What makes a human being vomit? When there's a foreign object in your system that's not supposed to be there, the body rejects it. And it comes up whether you want it to or not. You can put your hand over and grab a can. It's coming out. And it's coming out with force because the body is saying this is not good for your system. That's the metaphor that God uses talking about people that are sometime on fire and sometime cold with him. He says, better off you just be cold. It's, just, it's, the, it's the same consequence. But what is he ultimately saying? We're supposed to be on fire for the Lord. We should be excited all the time about the Lord. So is that saying we're outside doing flips and jumping over pews? That's not the excitement he's talking about. He's just talking about being fully engaged, those diligent students. That's what he's talking about. 
Many times that's often misinterpreted by people jumping up and down, ah, yelling amen. No, no, no. That's not because you don't find examples of that in the Bible. You find people that are locked into God's word. And God even says of the, those, the, those that do it, there's the polar opposite. He says, their lips do worship me, but your heart is far away. Look at that polar opposite. When you read, if you get a chance, read Matthew 7. It's talking about the day of judgment. There are those that went before the Lord and said, Lord, we've done many great things in your name. Some said we even cast out devils in your name. That in and of itself sounds like some pretty decent stuff, doesn't it, folks? But guess what, guess what God says? Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. And then I love how it ends. I never knew you. Woo! Imagine hearing that. That's right. Well, it, it equates to eternal death because they were so caught up in what they thought was right without conferring with what does God's word say? I think I told you all a year ago, oh man, I mean a while ago, when I lived in California, I had a good friend and he was always venturing looking at different denominations. And he said, it's this one I want you to check out because you can talk to the guy. And it happened to be on the campus of USC, University of Southern California. And when we pulled up, and he said, they have worship Saturday night. I was like, oh, okay. So we pulled up, and as we were going in, I thought we were going to a jazz concert, Sister Faye. Because, I mean, they were blowing. They, I mean, they were getting down musically. If you like jazz, you would have loved it. And I walked in, and I'm, I'm looking around. Big old place. Big old auditorium. And I'm playing. And I see one guy in the middle with all everything he had on was white. White hat, white suit. I mean, nothing wrong with that. But obviously, he was drawing attention to himself. And I said, hmm. so I made a beeline to him. And just because you're a minister, you ain't got to take on, uh, you know, boys like, how are you, son? I said, how are you, sir? I'm doing great in the Lord's day. I said, so you're saying this is the Lord's day? And I want to be careful. I don't want to come in like I'm coming in like a, a, a outlaw Josie Wells firing guns. No, I, I just want to have a conversation. And he said, you seem to have a problem with what we're doing. I said, I have some questions. Oh, well, fire away with your questions then, young man. I said, you know, the Bible says we're supposed to worship on the first day of the week. Yes, it does say that. And I said, well, this is not the first day of the week. And he agreed. He's like, you're, you're absolutely right. But this is the night where most kids go out and sin and party. So I decided to do it on this night. And all I said was, who gave you that authority? He says, I feel I'm doing a good work. I'm not denying a good work. I'm talking about spiritual worship according to the way God said it. And of course, he talked around it. I got a nice band. I was like, I agree. And then we got into, well, what about mechanical instruments in the church? Well, if you look at Revelation, I said, that's a look. That's representing something. Those aren't actual instruments. And if you look at the Old Testament, I said, hold on again, sir. I said, is, are we in the Old Testament? We're a New Testament church. And every time I would interrupt him, he would, I could tell something was sinking in because everybody just accepted it because it was fun. It was entertaining. But it wasn't Bible-based, folks. And you see here, God is not playing with Joshua. And these are life or death situations. He says, if you're going to obey me, you're going to obey me. If not, there's going to be consequence. His men were running back terrified over a smaller army versus going into Jericho, walls falling down, a million, million man army. They took it like it was nothing. What was the difference? The obedience to God long before the war. Now you got somebody stealing stuff and hiding it. It's a travesty. Joshua realized it. He knelt down and was feeling down. God said, get up on your feet because he's the leader. And he's letting them know. Let's see where this goes. Verse 12. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were cursed. What does that mean, turn their backs before the enemies? Their enemies were chasing them. The nation of Israel was running, as opposed to going. Remember, they came to take the land. If the land is back there where Thomas and Ricky is, and I'm going to take the land, why would I be coming this way? Because I'm afraid I'm running. I'm being chased. Why would I be scared if God is on my side? Because there's sin in the camp. 
but turn their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people. That's the key phrase. Before, now when they took over Jericho, remember before they went into Jericho? Do you remember what was the first thing Joshua told them? Sanctify yourselves. What does sanctify mean? It means you're being set apart for a special work. Get your mind right. Get everything you're supposed to do for God in place because we're getting ready to go into battle. That was the first thing Joshua told them. When, they, when the walls of Jericho came down, did Joshua stop the people and say, sanctify yourself again? That's why he's putting this on Joshua too. Joshua sent the spies right out to Ai. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you got to take time to sit back. I tell people the phrase I use is calculate. You know, you hear the term count your blessings. Nothing wrong with that. But when you look at the, 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 the Hebrew and Greek definition of counting, it's simply one, two, three, four, five. I'm blessed with this. I'm blessed with this. I'm blessed with this. Nothing wrong with that. But when you go to the original word, it's calculate your blessings. Is there a difference? You see, when you calculate, you see how it ties into the overall whole. I'll give you a great example over the holidays. I hope most of you ate as much as I ate. My wife cooked an extravaganza, Sister Peg, like two days of cooking. And I enjoyed every bit of it. And it would have been fun. Just It would have been interesting to say, ooh, that was some good food, baby. I sat back. I watched her get up in the morning, go in that kitchen to cook. I'm in a wheelchair, keep in mind. She's doing everything, washing dishes, cooking, cleaning. And I'm thinking, man, I had a good meal. My baby got up. I calculated just how good a wife I really had. And it feels in, incredible. We had some great fellowship last night with the boys and Tiana. And I was like, wow. And it, I was calculating all my, not just counting them, but calculating. Because when you calculate, it affects the whole. I'm a math teacher. I know what a fraction is. The top part of the fraction is the numerator. The bottom is the denominator. The bottom tells you what the whole is. The part up top is the part that affects it. I had 100,000 over 100,000. That's quite a fraction, isn't it? Because it was every little piece affected the whole and it was beautiful. That's, that's ultimately what sanctification is all about. You realize who you are and what God has for you to do. And then if you don't do it, you're in a, you're in a sticky situation. Let's see what God is saying to Joshua. Up, verse 13. Up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee. O Israel, thou cannot stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. What is God ultimately saying now? Now, number one, he's holding Joshua accountable, but he's telling them what to do. Now, he's saying there's an accursed thing amongst the people. One of the hardest things for people to do is to police themselves. So they're going to have to go in and find where this is. You think that's an easy thing? I take people all the way back to the, to the ark when the flood came in Genesis. When you read that verse, who can tell me who closed the ark? God. Why didn't he let Noah close the ark? Why did he let just why did he let any human being close the ark of the Lord? Now, when you read between the lines, it's because human feelings get involved. What about that person you know, you played ball with every day? And you tried to tell him, man, you better get on the ark. You know, it's, it's gonna rain one day. Yeah, right. No, well, come on, man. Th th throw me the ball. All of a sudden there come a raindrop. Two or three hit them on the head. Then they think three or four times. It's like maybe they go run it. God closed it because he gave them over 120 years to make the decision. And it was all about faith in the first place. So God made sure he closed that door. It's no different now, folks. We in the church, it's our responsibility to go preach the gospel and say that there's one church in the Bible. People say that's a tough saying. Well, is it any tougher than saying there's one ark? And he said one ark at a time when it had never rained, folks. That's heavy, but you had to accept it. So when Christ comes the second time, there's no, oh, I figured it out now. No, he's giving you ample time. May we always, always remember that. Sometimes we make our job harder than what it is. 
God has done the work. He's just told us to be obedient. Let's see what it, now. Remember, now they have to go in and police themselves. What if it's your best friend who had the golden nugget? Oh, come on, Charles, man. Come on, maybe, maybe we can do it. I'll, I'll hide it, dude. Uh, that's just as bad. Accountability and repentance before the Lord is exactly what it is. Now, the Bible names who the individual was. It was Achan, right? What's stopping Achan from going to get what he had and bringing it before Joshua and repenting? That's still a great thing. He, he, he disobeyed God, but he's repenting. We don't see Achan coming forward, do we? At least we haven't seen it yet. Let's see what happens. And it's a powerful lesson for all of us. Verse 14, in the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes. And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof. And the family which the Lord shall take shall take, shall come by households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. Verse 15, and it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire. Watch this. He and all that he had, because he had transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he had wrought folly in Israel. It's easy for people to say, man, that's a hard consequence. People die because of this man's disobedience. It's called consequences of sin. That's why we are our brother and sister's keeper. Things we can do, I can make horrible decisions. And the best example is just being a, being a part of a, of a family. If I choose to go home, Brother Slocum, tomorrow, and I'm enjoying the, the break, and then January 3rd comes around, and I'm supposed to be back in school teaching, I think I'm going to stay on the break, baby. I ain't, I ain't going back. My wife said, what you going to do? I'm just going to stay home and relax in this wheelchair for the rest of my life. Well, I, how are we going to pay the bill? Uh, something will happen. You see, there's going to be a consequence on the family, right? Might lose the house, other things. Man, that time was really quick. Something might be, it would lose pay. I can't pay bills or anything. There's a consequence. And the more of a family you have, the more you can have a consequence on a family. Now God is going to bring them out family by family. They're going to find out who this is. I promise when that first bell rings, I always want to leave it open for questions. So we'll pause on Joshua chapter 7, verse 15, or verse 16. I'm going to open it up now if you have any questions. Brothers, let me know if there's any on Zoom. An auditorium, any questions at all? Anything that wasn't clear, anything that catches your attention? If not, you know I'm going to have some for you all. And I might call you by name, Aiken. <laughs> Any questions online, T? Nothing yet? Okay, here in the classroom, who can tell me what was the name of the first land of Canaan that Israel overtook and what was the name of the second one that they were about to overtake, but they were found in sin? Charles? First one was Jericho. The second one was what again? AI. AI is right. People say, how do you pronounce that? When you say AI, it's literally spelled A and an I, but it is pronounced AI. <laughs> second one, who can tell me what was the process of repentance in the Old Testament? How do you know somebody was repenting from the nation of Israel? What did they do? It was a combination of two things. Brother David. Well, when, this is when they were, when they were, were, were repenting. I'm sorry, did you say something else? Rent their clothes is one. What was the second part? Ashes and sackcloth. Now, don't mistake the ashes with sometimes you see with the Catholic religion, they'll put the cross. That's not what they did. They, they, they literally poured ashes from the heifer over them, and they, and they were in a kneeling position. That was the context of being in mourning and repentance. Remember when a, a great example, if you guys want to read it over the break, when you go to, uh, remember a guy named Jonah? Remember he was mad over the nation of Nineveh because of what they did, but did Nineveh repent? Yes, they did. Watch, read what they did. It's a short book. Read what they did when they repented. And they weren't even from the nation of Israel. They rent their clothes. 
They bowed down and they poured ashes over it. They said from everyone, from the greatest man to the least. I mean, it's a blessing to see one or two repenting. That whole nation repented. But Joshua was mad because he wanted them to be struck down. Queen. I, I, I don't know because the Bible doesn't go into details about that. I'm speaking just in, just in the book. I want to stay with questions, oh child. Now, you, you're talking about that was before Jonah, though. Nineveh had a horrible, horrible reputation. But where that's mentioned, that's before the book of Joshua. But Charles, I think there's somebody to talk one-on-one -on -one with. Because I'm going to leave it open for anybody that has questions on Joshua that we spoke about already. And nobody had any, so now we're going to move on to our next question. What was the name of the gentleman who had sinned? Brother Slocum. Say again. Yes, Aiken. What did he do? That's right. They were supposed to put it, they're supposed to take it to the Lord's treasury. And that was just a general collection area. Now, why was it? We know that, that Aiken did this. Why did the Lord? Lord seemed that he came a little bit hard to Joshua. Somebody tell me why before we close out. Why did the Lord come, come a little hard at Joshua if Joshua didn't do it? That requires a little bit of talk through with Sister Aldridge. That's point one. Come on now. Well, that, that's partially we need a little bit more, but, but you got it because the bell rung. I'm going to fill in. You hit it right on the head, though. Joshua was the leader, and every time they went into a movement on behalf of the Lord, Brother Aldrich hit it earlier. They were supposed to sanctify themselves. Did they sanctify themselves before they went into AI? Nope. Did they sanctify themselves before they went into Jericho? Yes. Which one had the victory? Jericho. Because if they would have sanctified themselves before they went into AI, they may have discovered that there was sin in the camp. Who had the bigger army, Jericho or Ai? Jericho by thousands, hundred thousands. But which one, what, uh, what did the Bible mean when it said they turned their backs to their enemies? And when I say that cracks me up when you get the visual of it. But what, did it, what does that mean? That's right, they were running from them. Mm -hmm. Thank you all, Charles. We got to follow up on that question, and we'll and we'll bring it back out. But thank you all for your for your. You all seem to be locked in. I appreciate you all for coming to Bible study. Please stay with us with this lesson. If you can be here, come. If not, turn up to turn into tune into us on Zoom.